So today's message, I told you that I would be very vulnerable with you today. I'm going to talk to you about pastors today. What I'm going to share with you today, most pastors won't share at their own church. They might preach it at someone else's churches. In fact, one of the rules of thumb that I have is when I do get invited to speak at another church, I always do this. I'll always give honor to the pastor of the house, and I'll say some things on his behalf that he most likely won't say or can't say because it's uncomfortable for him to say those things. But as I connect people to Jesus, I'll connect people to Jesus through their pastor. And so I'm sure to always say some of these things that I'm going to share with you today about pastors. If you go back to the Old Testament, God has always, from the beginning, had a desire to have a communication and to have an encounter with his people. God loves his people. It was the Jewish people in the beginning, but he loved the whole world, and he would bring the gospel, the good news, through the Jewish people, through the Messiah. His name is Jesus. And all the way back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah prophesied. It was a the, they, we call them the prophets because they could foresee and they would prophesy. And Jeremiah prophesied about the day and the hour that you live in today. It's pretty cool to go back and read this. Jeremiah chapter 3, he talks about, I didn't have room for it in your notes, but I want you to get this because he talked about the Ark of the Covenant. Now, because God has always had a desire to meet with his people, he met with his people through the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle. The tabernacle is not some religious ceremonial thing. The, the tabernacle was literally the way that God came and met with his people. And there was a place and there was a day. The place was called the Holy of Holies and the day was called the Day of Atonement. It was that day once a year where the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and he would have an encounter with God on behalf of all of the people of the nation. It was incredible. The people looked so forward to it because they knew the Jewish people knew that on that day, for that year, all of their sins were paid for and atoned for that day. It was awesome. God's holy presence dwelt in that box that had uh, gold. It had gold angels carved out in gold. It had the mercy seat, and it was because of the mercy seat that your sins were forgiven. It was a foretelling and a foreshadow of things to come the day that we live in, post-Jesus. Oh, it was incredible. And what Jeremiah did in Jeremiah chapter 3 is he said, there's going to be a day where I'm not going to call nations, I'm going to call individuals in that day, and I will bring you into your place, and I will give you spiritual shepherds after my own heart in that final time, in that final day. These shepherds will feed you with knowledge, with understanding, with judgment. And that word judgment simply means this. It means wisdom to choose, wisdom to know what direction. That your spiritual shepherds, pastors is another word some translations use. That in that day, that final day, that hour before Jesus brings us back home, I'm going to give you pastors. And then he goes through and he talks about the ark. He gets back into the ark again, and he said, in that day, you'll say no more, or you'll never seriously remember, or miss, or even repair, or even build again the ark, for God's presence will be with his people in that day. Now, why am I excited about that? Well, the reason I'm excited is because we literally are living in that day. We're not looking forward in hope that someday the Messiah will come. The Messiah did come. His name is Jesus. And because he came, we have life. We have his spirit. Now, when you go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 11, the scripture tells us that God gave the fivefold ministry to the church. What's the fivefold ministry? The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. And it's a fold. It's not separate ministries. It comes in a package. Usually it's the package of your shepherd, your pastor, the five fold ministry. It's folded up into five. You know what the five fold ministry is. Boom, boom, boom. You ever feel like your pastor brings the five fold at you? Hopefully not. I hope you're feeling the love today. 
Well, I want to share with you about leadership in the church. My prayer is that through this series that this is not just a call for volunteers. I mean, if we needed volunteers, you could be one, but what we really need, what the church really needs is the church needs you to step into that God-given position of leadership that you were designed for. Some of you were designed to be business leaders in the community to bring millions of dollars into the church. Can I get a witness? And who wants to volunteer for that one? I always look and say, yeah, I'll take that one. Bring business to my business so I can be a blessing to the church. Others of you, your teachers, some of you are administrators. Boy, that's a big one in the church. We talked a little bit about some of those last week, some of those roles last week. And if you didn't hear that, go back and listen to that sermon on Facebook or on our YouTube channels, the best. Go to enjoychurch.com, click on archive messages. Go back and watch that. Today, though, I want to talk to you about, I told you I was going to talk to you about being a mainstay to your pastor. Now, Pastor Laura and I, we co-pastor the church. It's not me being the senior pastor and she's my assistant. We together are the senior pastors of this church. And we pastor together in this. And I want to talk to you about what it means to be a mainstay. The scripture talks about your role with your pastor. And this is the part that's a little bit difficult for a lot of pastors to share with their congregations. But since I'm so comfortable with you guys and since I know you all so well, is it okay if I go ahead and share it with you? I'm just going to be vulnerable. I'm a PK, a preacher's kid. I grew up. In the ministry, I grew up around the ministry. I'm friends with hundreds and hundreds of other pastors. I love pastors. The older I get, the more I have pastors contact me for counsel, for wisdom. Help me, pastor. Give me some advice. I have that happen every week without exception. And it's not that I have all the answers, but I grew up in it. I've been doing this for a couple days. And I, I want to share some of these things with you. I'm going to warn you, a little bit of it is uh, vulnerability for me. I'm going to be vulnerable with you. I'm going to be open with you. I'm going to share with you the needs of pastors. And maybe you can take this message and teach another church some of this and bless some people, okay? Because there's some demands that come with the ministry that oftentimes are, are, are difficult. What is a mainstay? Well, a mainstay, as the Bible talks about being a mainstay for your pastor, is a chief support. You being a chief support for your pastor, upholding, defending, fighting for, championing the cause of your pastor, supporting them, keeping them in existence. The definition says helping them carry on, helping them persevere, prolong, and perpetuate their ministry, bolstering them and propping them up, being a mainstay. Picture it as a construction work that you have a mainstay of the construction. It helps the building stay together. And that's the role of the body. So my role as the pastor, the shepherd, as Jeremiah prophesied, and as the book of Ephesians, Paul says, my role is to feed you, to bring you spiritual food, nourishment for your spirit so that you grow spiritually, so that you're challenged in uh, your spiritual growth, and so that you develop a motivation, an inspiration, and a hunger to fulfill. We say it in our mission statement. If you came to our pre-service rally today, you heard this. We exist to lead people. Come on, y'all. We're going somewhere. We're not just existing. Come on, we're going somewhere to lead people to experience and enjoy the unconditional love of Jesus. He loves you unconditionally. And I love that part of the mission statement, but let me just tell you, part of my passion and one of the things that I love the most is the second part of it, and that is to help them reach their full potential in him. I love helping you get results in life. I want you to have good results in your marriage, good results in your finances. I want you to have good results in your physical body. I want you to have good results in your leadership in the church, you finding your niche, you finding your gift, you fulfilling the reason and the whole purpose that God puts you here on planet Earth. It's not you were never a mistake, even though we've made mistakes. You were not a mistake. 
God shows you. God has a plan for your life, everybody. And it's a good plan. So that's why my role is, is to equip you, to feed you, to help you discover and find your role. And when I'm most fulfilled is when I see that happening in the church. Let me read some facts and some stats from Fuller Institute about pastors. 90% of pastors reported that they work more than 46 hours a week. I think that's a low number. Every pastor friend of mine works like about 80 hours a week. People, they tease me once in a while and say, Pastor, what do you do all week? I mean, all you have to do is come up with a sermon on Sunday. Come on, what do you do? Do you golf all week? I always say, yes, I wish. I love to fish, but I don't get a chance to do that too often. I have a motorcycle. I've really been toying with selling my motorcycle. I could use the cash right now. I I haven't had time to ride it, so why? Because... I'm working. I I don't want you to have pity or sympathy on me. I'm going to describe to you some things so that you kind of can understand the life of your pastor because the church will be much healthier if you understand the role of your pastor and maybe some of the burdens that I'm carrying and Pastor Laura were carrying that you can come up alongside of us and carry those with us being the church. You guys can do that too. 80%, listen to this, 80% believe that the pastorate has affected their families in a negative way. I grew up in a pastor's home. I would say no doubt about that. I tell my kids, I tell them this all the time. I'm sorry, God chose you for our family. He must think you are tough enough to handle it. We live in a fishbowl. Pastor's kids live in a fishbowl. What happens with a fishbowl? Well, a fishbowl is where people come up and they Look inside. Everything that happens in life gets thumped on, dink, 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 gets criticized, gets looked at, gets observed. Eventually, all of those secrets that the pastor's kids think they were keeping secret, guess what, everybody? (laughs) Yeah, people tell. We always find out. Mom and dad always finds out. Listen, and the pastor's kids, they have it rougher than mom and dad do in the fishbowl. I knew because I was also a pastor's kid. So we've always told our kids about that. It's a true process. Listen to this. 33% of pastors that were surveyed in this survey said that being in the ministry is an outright hazard to their family. That could be true. 75% report significant stress related a significant stress related crisis at least once in their ministry at least once i'm like at least once how about 50 <laughs> 50% of pastors feel unable to meet the needs and the demands of the job now we're getting into the nitty gritty 90% feel like they were inadequately trained to cope with the ministry demands. I would say yes, because even in Bible college, Bible college, they teach you theology. They teach you maybe how to do weddings, hospital visits, some practical stuff there. But they do not teach you how to deal with the surprises of ministry, the conflict of people, the conflict of values, the conflict of vision. of pastors say that they have a lower self-image than when they first started in the ministry because the ministry is tough. (laughs) T.D. Jakes described it this way. He said being in the ministry is like, let's picture putting on football, shoulder pads, football pads, putting on a helmet, putting you in a closed room, turning the lights off and giving 20 men a baseball bat and let them swing at you. T.D. Jake says, that's what the ministry's like. And I heard that and I thought, T.D., that is an incredible description of what my dad's life was like and much of what our life was like in the beginning years of ministry. I learned more from my dad about what not to do in the ministry than I did what to do. And that he actually had a discussion with me about on his deathbed. And he said to me, Darren, I'm thankful that you're second generation pastor. 
because you've learned so much of what not to do from what I've done wrong. Not intentionally. It's not, it's not a uh, disgrace to you. It's a compliment to you that you get to learn from what I did wrong. By the way, our mission statement Our values, the culture of our church, of who we are, what we say is the most important, what we say is not important at all, that came from growing up with my daddy. It came from growing up, our values, those values, that's that's the glue that holds our church together. The strength of our church is our ability to go, this is why we exist, lead people to experience and enjoy the unconditional love of Christ and to help people reach their full potential in him. And the second part is our values, and that is love, love's number one. We're going to walk in love. We're going to be love. We're going to love Jesus. We're going to love people, unconditionally love people. We're not going to judge people. And then we're going to walk in unity. We have different opinions. One likes red, one likes green, one likes blue. But guess what? We're going to come together in unity, not based on disagreement, but based on the value. And then joy. How many of you are glad joy's in the top five? I mean, sometimes life can be so rough. We've decided we're going to have the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. We're going to have some fun, everybody. Come with us. We're going to have fun together through these next decades that we live together and do life together and reach people for Jesus. And you do it by extreme ownership. You take ownership and responsibility. This is your church. Come on, it's your church. And what are we going to do? We're going to promote the love of Jesus and promote what he's done. I was blind, but now I see We're going to promote Jesus. That's our values. Let me finish this list up. 70% say they have a lower self-image when they started, and that, I would say, is absolutely true. I'm friends with a lot of pastors. I've struggled with this one myself. Is is what I'm doing, does it make a difference? Has 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 it made a difference? Does it make a difference? And the value you often place on what you pour in and the fruit of the harvest that you get back. And the enemy is always there to scream in your ear, you're not making a difference. Every pastor friend of mine, doesn't matter the size of the church, that message is screamed in their ear when they go to bed at night. 70% say that they do not have or consider someone to be a close friend. I want to jump into the problems of being a pastor. The number one problem of pastors, my friends, is loneliness. Number one. Why is that? Let me explain to you the reason that loneliness is such a dear companion of the average pastor. It's for this reason. Let me uh, use another illustration to explain to you why pastors struggle in that area of being lonely. If you know anybody and if you have been divorced more than one, two, or three times, you realize this, you understand this, that you think, you would think, wouldn't you think, that the more divorces you go through, the more marriages you have, the better you'd get at it? It doesn't work that way, does it? I'm going to share with you the reason it doesn't. If you're in your second marriage, they say that you have a 50-50 chance of going through a second divorce. If you're in your third marriage, it jumps from 50 statistically to 70%. Why is that? You did learn more. You did. You really did learn more. Here's the problem. Your tolerance for pain goes down. It's like in your first marriage, man. You'll put up with a lot of stuff from him or her. You'll put up with it trying to make it work. And then when it did fall apart and when you did go through a divorce, you're in your second marriage now and you're like, man, I learned a lot from that. Here's one thing I learned. I ain't putting up with that again. (laughs) You get into your second, your third. By the time you're in your third or fourth marriage, your tolerance for pain is no longer up here. It's all the way down here. And you're like, I'm going to tell you, you look at me wrong. I'm I'm out of here. I'm gone. (laughs) What happens to pastors is very similar. Pastors, especially in the beginning, in their first five years of ministry, they're in love with pastoring. They're in love with seeing people come to Jesus, with seeing life change happen. They love people. And then someone who they said, they say, we hear us pastors hear this all the time. I love this church. This is the best church ever. God has changed my life. I love you, pastor. You've been 
Oh, your word feeds me. I have been so good. And, and then, then uh, yeah, something happens. And they said they would love you forever. They said they're committed. They said they'd be with you, and then they leave. And, and pastors have laid it out, and they've laid their heart on the line, and they love their sheep. They love the people that they pastor. And then someone leaves them. Well, maybe, maybe it's even worse than that. Every pastor friend that I know have had attacks in the ministry. And someone that said, I love you, someone that said, I'm committed to you, then became an enemy of the ministry. Maybe they disagreed with a decision that was made or something that you preached or you preached it too hard or you didn't say it right or you didn't show up when you, I needed you, pastor, and you weren't there. And, and then they hurt you and they leave you. And most pastors, to deal with it, have to suck it up. They can't talk about it, especially if it's been an attack and an offense where somebody, the pastor, can't get up and say, hey, church, let me tell you what's wrong with Billy Joe. He's got these problems. Let me listen. He can't preach that. He's got to live an unoffendable life. So what most pastors do in their private life is they become shielded and protected. I'm going to love you, but I'm not going to let you close to me because you may hurt me like the last 50 people hurt me. So I'm going to love you at a little bit of a distance, not going to let you in because it hurts so bad. Most people, most pastors, they deal with that. They learn to live lonely. By the way, Paul, the apostle Paul, he struggled with that loneliness because he had been attacked. If you want to read about it, go to 2 Timothy. If you're a note taker, write this down. Chapter 4, Paul talks about his loneliness. Paul talks about the men that he trusted, that he poured his life into, who turned on him, who hated him, who attacked him. He talked about what? cures for the loneliness and how he dealt with it. He dealt with it through companionship of those that he could trust. The question is, who can I really trust? Because the last group said I could trust him, but then they didn't. He said, bring me my coat, a physical need. Bring my coat to me. I need comfort. It's going to be getting cold. He said, bring my coat. He said, oh, bring those books too. I get comfort when I read. And then he said, bring the scriptures. I need the parchment. I need the scriptures. I get comfort from the word. Anyway, he talked a little bit about loneliness. That's enough for that. But I laughed and I cried. One of my good friends, Pastor Ed Young from Fellowship Church, Dallas, Texas. Ed said, Darren, you know, the ministry is so beautiful and it's so brutal. So he coined this phrase, the ministry is brutal. It's just brutal. One of the things that Pastor Laura and I, we do in our family, we have five children and we don't hide the pain of the ministry from our kids. But at the same time, we magnify the rewards of ministry. What is the reward of ministry? By the way, I don't want your sympathy today. I'm not sharing this message with you today to get your sympathy. I don't want your feeling sorry for me. And Pastor Laura, I want you to understand we're doing good. We're doing better than we've ever done in the ministry. We're healthy, but I want you to hear some of these things so that you can come alongside because here's what I believe. I believe we haven't reached the pinnacle of our potential as a church family yet. I believe we're going somewhere. So we tell our kids, you know what? It is fun to be in the ministry. God calls pastors family. On my dad's side, I'm second generation pastor. But on my mama's side, we've got like nine pastors. We've got Lutherans. We've got Presbyterians. We've got Methodists. We've got Baptists. We've got Pentecostals. We've got Charismatics. I mean, crazy Maddocks. We got them all. On my mama's side, how is that and how does that happen? God called the Levites and said, it's going to be in your family for generations. You're going to notice that in the ministry. With our kids, our kids, have, we've been authentic with them. We, we talk about the underbelly of the church world sometimes with them, but we also magnify 
and talk about intentionally on purpose how wonderful it is to serve Jesus in this capacity of being pastors. Church, it, there's no reward on planet Earth than seeing people come to Jesus, than watching a life who is a far away from God type person who maybe didn't even have any revelation or understanding of God, seeing them come into relationship and we talk about it with our kids. And there's nothing like seeing our kids get excited about the same thing. When I first told my dad, I said, Dad, I feel like God's calling me into the ministry. I don't want to do it. I'm shy. I don't want to go through the pain that I've seen you go through. My dad, here's what he said to me, and some of you may have heard this growing up. My dad said to me, he said, Darren, if there is anything else you can do for a career besides being a pastor, you need to do it unless you can't do anything and be happy. Have you heard anybody ever say that before? And my dad told me that, and I have heard other ministers say the same thing. If you can do anything else and be happy, do that, because being in the ministry is one of the toughest, most challenging things on planet Earth. Why is that? The book of Zechariah says this. that if you want to hurt the sheep or the congregation, attack the shepherd and scatter the sheep. The spiritual warfare and the spiritual battle of a shepherd is epic for this reason. The temptations that come, the discouragements that come, the depressions that come, the attacks that come to pastors is unbelievable. Why? Because if the devil can derail the pastor or the pastor's family, he can scatter the congregation. Nothing will split a church, will cause division in a church quicker than the mess-ups of the pastor of the church. So I heard T.D. Jakes talk about this one too. He, he loves pastors as well. When he pastored in West Virginia, I could never gather a crowd larger than 300 people in his church, his own home church. He'd get 300 people in the church. But he could go to Atlanta, he could go to Dallas, he could go to New York, and he could fill up a stadium of 60, 80,000 people. He'd go back home wondering, why? Why do I have this anointing? Why can I gather this many people but at home? We can't break that 300 barrier hardly at all. T.D. Jakes took the shoes off of his feet. He clacked them together. He said, the Lord told me to shake the dust off of my feet and to move on down the road. He moved to Dallas, Texas, and the first Sunday they opened for church, they had 7,000 people show up. Why? Well, it was T.D. Your anointing has a lot to do with your location. Here's the amazing part, not that part, this part. T.D. Jake said that in the first couple of years, two or three years of his church, that he would preach and the church was exploding. They eventually, in, over those next few months, had 21,000. They went to 30,000 people attending every weekend. T.D. Jakes, he'll tell you this today. He said, I would go home after preaching, people getting saved, the church being packed, the church being full. I would go home. And he said, I would get in my closet and I was so lonely, I was so depressed, I would get in there and I would cry and half the time I didn't know even why, but I would weep for hours in pain and I was so lonely, I felt like I couldn't tell anybody, I felt like I couldn't be vulnerable and he was in pain. And he said, I had to learn how to overcome that pain and that depression. I just want to be real with you with I don't want your sympathy and I don't want you like feel, oh, pastor, he need, man, he's messed up. <laughs> I want to be real with you about what pastors deal with, just so you know. The first one is loneliness. That's number one. Almost every pastor I know feels lonely. It just, it's, it's just part of the territory. The second one is Stress. Think about this, the demands of everything working from all volunteers. <laughs> 
I mean, the whole church, the success of the church relies on you guys saying, I'll step up and I'll do that. Now, we, the church, has made the mistake of thinking of ourselves as volunteers. I'm here to teach you, you're not a volunteer, you are a leader. You don't step up to say, I'll volunteer for that position. I'm saying to you, you're stepping in, putting on the suit of a leader in the church. Own it. It's ownership. Own it. The stress of leading an organization of all volunteers. Think about this one. The demands of budget. The demands of budget. So not only does the church work and the wheels turn and the gears turn because you're volunteering, you're stepping up into your leadership, but the effectiveness and the power of the church really depends on you volunteering your money, giving your money. Once in a while, people will say to me, Pastor, why don't we resurface the parking lot? Why don't we fix the roof? There's leaks. Why don't we put a new air conditioning up? And I, I never say this. I told you I'm being authentic. I never say this out loud to them. But, but the thought comes, well, why don't you step up and give some money to it? <laughs> I mean, that's just so you know, that's it's happening up here. I might not say it here, but it's happening up here. Why don't you step up and give some money? See, half of the church, well, not even half. Some people tithe. And then some people throw some tokens. You know, like, Here's a buck or two. It's getting quiet in here. <laughs> do, you, you guys, do you guys feel uncomfortable when I talk about money for other people? Like, I'm a tither, so I could care less. But I feel sorry for them because I probably know they're not. Like, now you're really being quiet. <laughs> Let me just say this. If we all tithed, doesn't matter how much you got. Tithe is just 10%. Billionaire, 10%. Poor, 10%. The promise is the same for both, that the 90% will be blessed when you do it that way. But once in a while, someone will say, you know, hey, why don't the church do this? I've discovered this, that the loudest critics in the church, I've discovered it because I heard my dad say it many years ago, and I'm friends with all these pastors, the loudest negative voices, the church needs to do this and the church ought to do that and we need a new this and there needs to be a new that. Those voices typically, if I go back and I check the giving record, it's usually a big fat bagel, meaning a zero, and they've got the loudest, most negative voices. And it's amazing how the tithers they're there, but they're not complaining. Just a thought. I mean, I'm just telling you. I told you I'd be vulnerable with you today. These are the things that some pastors uh, go to an early grave over. Sometimes in the ministry, a church that's believing God for big things, because here's why. The demands of a great vision that God has given to the house by the way, if you have the money for your vision, it's probably not a big enough vision. God wants a relationship with you that you constantly, every day, need to be trusting him for new growth, for the vision that he has for your life. And in the ministry, so many times the vision and the demands of the vision are so big that you have to, not only as an individual but I bet you this works in your personal life this way too, that you have to depend on God for the money to show up. And if you're a salesperson, you make more sales calls. But if you're a church, how do you get that to happen? Your pastor gets up and says, bring your neighbor to church. I would, but I'm afraid you'll preach on money, PD. It's funny because people say, I want, I, somebody told me this two weeks ago, I want to go to a church where they don't talk about money. Once again, didn't say it, but I thought it. Well, then why are you going to go to work tomorrow if money's not a big deal to you? You're going to go spend 40 hours at some job that at the end of that week, you're going to expect a paycheck. Go in there and don't expect one. I didn't say it. I thought it. 
How about this one? When the lottery was 900 million, almost $1 billion, why did you, you non-money loving person, why did you go buy some tickets? I know because you hate money and you just like want to give it all away. How about this one? Can we really have fun? Next week will be a whole different sermon, so you're safe. You're going to go through McDonald's. You're going to buy your kid an ice cream cone, one of those little bitty miniature ones and, and a little one that probably is going to fall off the cone or melt in this heat. And what's McDonald's going to do? They're going to ask you for money. The audacity of McDonald's. Those ice creams and those hamburgers, they're going to ask me for money for those. They should pay me to eat them. I'm having fun with you. I'm just sharing with you. This stuff stresses pastors out. You go to bed, you pray. You've experienced this before. Three o'clock in the morning, you sit straight up in bed and go, oh my goodness, how are we going to make it this month, this week? You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. Let me move on. Number three, pastors deal with feeling feelings of being inadequate or inferior. Um, uncapable to do the job that stands before them. Did you know that in most pastors' family where the wife is a supporting role to the pastor that oftentimes, in fact, focus on the family, they said that 40% of the letters that come to them come from pastors' wives who are upset about ministry. They're mad at God many times. God, why'd you choose us to do this? They're mad at God many times. Oftentimes, they're mad at the church congregation. And at other times, they're mad at their husband. <laughs> I know you all have never experienced that before, but pastors' wives can get mad at their husbands sometimes. I love working with Pastor Laura because we work through the issues together. It's not her, it's not me, it's us together. Number four, depression. Depression can be a big one. I, I, I told you, I'm friends. I'll never out my other pastor friends. I'll never out them, but I do want to say this. When we're together, us pastor friends will get together. Oftentimes, we'll talk about these issues to encourage one another. We need that from one another. And I would say this, that if many of the pastor friends that I'm very close with, many of them, are on medication for a purpose because of the stress and because of the depression and the discouragement of leading the body of Christ. They're on medication. Now, I personally am not on medication, but I probably need to be. I probably need to go. Let me say this. My wife can tell you this. There have been a few times, a couple windows during the ministry where I have talked with her and said, should I go to the doctor? This is stressing me out horribly. Should I go get some medication? And, and I didn't do it, but here's my deal, just so you know. I don't have a problem if you do do it. I believe God can heal you from it. I believe God can, can take that pain away, can take that discouragement and depression away from you. But if you need to be for a minute, I get it. I've been there. I could do it. Right now, I believe that in Joy Church, our family, I believe we're at the healthiest place we've ever been as a church family. We don't have... I'm not... I'm not sharing this with you because we're dealing with issues right now. You know what I'm doing? This is a preemptive strike against the enemy. We've been there. We've been through the tough stuff. Right now, we're at a growth place. Our foundation is laid. We have good leaders. We have loyalty in the church. Good things are happening. But I know this, the spiritual warfare of what we do, the enemy does not take a nap. <laughs> He comes at us 
in the church world, when are the, the attacks of the enemy the strongest against the church? Well, it's when you start a new ministry within the church. It's when you do a new building project. It's when you're relocating or starting another campus or anytime the church is making a major decision. Why does the pastor need you to be a mainstay to him? Because there will be those four things happen in the life cycle of the church about every four or five years. We'll start something. We'll do something. And that's when the enemy attacks. Some of you, you remember what I'm getting ready to say. When you start a new ministry, we started our Club X Youth Ministry in 1995. We advertised. We went into all the high schools we, we rented, I rented, I wanted to buy one because I'm an electrician and I love lights, but it was one of those World War I uh, big round huge lights that would search through the sky, you know, and, and man, we rented one of those and we had our first night, it was on a Friday night. I, I would have been happy if we would have had 200, 300 kids show up. We had over 2,000, the highway was backed up and our road was backed up. We didn't have any police. We didn't know we needed police. There were people, kids everywhere. I'm up in my office praying, what do I do with this crowd? Our building would handle about 150 packed at that time. And we had 2,000. They couldn't even get in the door. I'm in my office, and there was a pounding on the door. Thought, whoa, that's intense. I went to the door. What's wrong? Pastor, 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 pastor. You got to come downstairs. There's a guy down here. I don't know what's wrong with him. He, you got to come down here. I walked around to the edge of the steps and as immediately, as soon as I saw him, I knew the man was demon possessed. I hadn't had a ton of experience dealing with demonic influenced people, but I knew this guy was demon possessed. I thought it no coincidence that it's our first night and a man like that shows up. He was not a young person. He was not a youth, but he was a demon filled dude. And I did what I had been taught to do, what I had faith to do, a righteous indignation like Satan's showing up at this event. I looked at him with the righteous anger of God. And I said, in the name of Jesus, that's all I said. And Lonnie was there. He was there that night. He knows this guy. When I pointed to him and said, in the name of Jesus, his body looked like someone punched him in the gut. He flew about 20 feet. He hit the glass windows. And uh, it looked like a bucket of, the best way I could describe it to you is a bucket of snot. Are you glad you came to church today? <laughs> I'm talking about a bucket, a boatload of snot <sighs> as he was flying. His head jerked. He goes back. He hits the glass doors. And that bucket of whatever it was, goo, came out of his head and slapped all over the windows. Now, let me tell you something about the enemy. Here's the good news. The devil will always overplay his hand. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. What the devil meant for harm, God's going to take it. God didn't cause it, but God will use it for good. I say this humbly. These kids that were all around, man, these kids were everywhere. And these kids, most of them weren't Christians yet. They witnessed this. There's probably about 200 kids that got to see this. The rest were out in the parking lot. But about 200 kids and God turned that whole thing around. Those kids that were inside, they were like, this pastor is bad. <laughs> he is bad. I'm telling you, they didn't, they were, man, they got around me and they were like military. They were like, we're not crossing you. It was fun. Hey, let me tell you one more. Some of you remember this. Our first Easter right here in this room. You guys remember the demon dude that went, I get up to preach. It's Easter. The place is packed. Anybody remember the dude? He said, right about there where Stacy's sitting right now. He stands up in the middle of my sermon. Bill remembers because Bill... Our security guy, he flew over there and sat behind the guy for the rest of the service. He stands up and he points at me and he starts saying some stuff. And I'm like, I'm trying to get these people saved. They only come to church on Easter and Christmas. 
Don't be doing that. I'm just, and in my head, I'm going real fast. What do I do? How do I? I want to walk in love. I don't want people to hate on me for the way I'm going to treat this guy. But I had to tell him the truth. Sir, I need you to sit down. We'll talk after the service right now. I've got a message that I want to share with everyone. I tell you that in love, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Adam and Christine, you guys were there too, I think, that day. You, you were with us when we started. And I was proud of Bill. Bill just like slowly just walked up, sat behind him. He was ready to do whatever needed to be done. I'm just saying this. When you attempt to do anything great in your life, the byproduct is opposition from the enemy. Someone that I just knew last week did something great. They took a step of faith. They did something. The enemy showed up immediately. Mark chapter 4 try to steal the joy of the word that was sown in their heart. I've got a testimony on this side of it. God has blessed them beyond. Let me close with this. How do you be a mainstay to your pastor? Moses had a mainstay. It was Aaron and her. Remember, they held his arms up. David had Jonathan who went to battle with him. Jesus had Peter, James, and John. Paul had this guy named Onesiphorus. What a cool name. If you're pregnant and you're having a little boy, I'm just saying, this guy was a great role model, Onesiphorus. Paul, there's Paul the legend, and then there was Paul the man. He talks about it in 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says, Onesiphorus often cheered me up. He said, many in Asia turned against me, especially Pagelius and Hermogenes. But Onesiphorus, he cheered me when I was put in jail. He wasn't ashamed of me. He continually encouraged Paul. He gave Paul breathing space. He allowed Paul to be himself. He stuck with Paul even while Paul was in difficult times and everybody else was abandoning him. He said, I'm with you, brother. The fifth thing that he did is he aggressively encouraged Paul, Paul said. So how can you be a mainstay to your pastors? Pray for us every day. Please do that. Live by the mission statement and the values of our church. Start tithing if you're not a tither. Be a financial support to your local church. Put out fires. If you ever hear any negativity or complaints about the church, put those fires out and bring unity to the situation. Here's another thing you can do. Accept your pastor's humanity. We're human. I don't know why God chose to pick such imperfect, imperfect people to be your pastors, but he did. But here's the the good news. Doesn't matter what church you go to, your pastor's going to be imperfect. Learn to accept that humanity. Carry the ball as often as you can. Encourage us. People have said to me, Pastor, I want to encourage you, but I don't want you to get the big head. Believe me. We need encouragement way more. You don't have to worry about us getting the big head because we're hearing more of how horrible we are than how we've blessed you. So encourage your pastor. Be a role model. How can you be a mainstay? Be a role model for other people to follow. Serve, help, get involved. Stay loyal to your pastor. Stay loyal. Be be loyal to them. Even when we might disappoint you sometimes, be loyal. Be loyal to your church. Stick with the church. Even when sometimes we go through heavy weather, stick with us. Here's a good one. Learn how to deal with and love people. We're in the people business, the business of loving people. Learn how to love people. Paul said, work on your own personality. Get better at that. Say the right words. Encourage one another. And I want to leave you with the last one. Put a smile on your face. It helps me so much when you smile. (laughs) Nod your head at me sometimes. Say amen. Yes, pastor. Yes. Do that once in a while. Just, I need that. Thank you. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 10 says, encourage one another often. Encourage one another to be thoughtful, to do helpful things, 
Some people, some people have gotten out of the habit of coming to church. Don't do that. We should encourage other, each other, especially since you know that the day of the Lord is coming. Hey, church, thank you for allowing us to be the type of church where I can get up here and just say it, spray it, wheel it, and deal it, and be authentic with you and know that you're okay.